Uh, hi everyone, welcome to this uh, webinar in the SSH Network webinar series. Uh, so that's the Social Sciences and Humanities Network related to IPES. My name is uh, Håkon Stockland and I organized this network and the webinar series together with uh, Maria Stenseke and Marla Emery. And today we have this uh, presentation that we are really looking forward to by Karina uh, Weiborn from the Australian National University, titled uh, Sustaining Diverse and Just Futures for Life on Earth, Insights from the Biodiversity Revisited Initiative. So Karina is an uh, environmental governance scholar with a specific focus on the interface between science, policy and practice. Her inter- and transdisciplinary research examines anticipatory governance under conditions of contestation, uncertainty, and environmental change, and the co-production on knowledge and social order. Karina has worked in Australia, the United States, and Switzerland with government and non-government organizations. Topics have included climate uh, adaption, wildfire governance, and biodiversity conservation. Karina was also the research advisor for the Luke Hoffman Institute from 2015 until 2020, where she co-led the Biodiversity Revisited Initiative, which uh, we will hear more about soon. She's now based at the Institute for Water Futures at the Australian National University. <coughs> She's a fellow of the Earth System Governance uh, Project and on the advisory committee of the Transformations Community of Practice, as well as the editorial board of environmental science and policy. Thank you, everybody, and thanks so much for inviting me to present today. Um, I've been really sad to miss many of your webinars so far because they've happened in the middle of the night, my time. So it's really, I, I appreciate that you're all getting up quite early to listen to this or getting to the office quite early to listen to this. Um, so yeah, thanks so much. So thanks so much for inviting me to talk. So I'm going to present some of the insights from the Biodiversity Revisited Initiative and really want to acknowledge from the outset that this has been a genuinely collaborative affair from the very beginning. Um, Jasper Montana, who's on the phone on the on the airwaves with us right now, um, was a really close collaborator in this process and a key actor in helping us to define and shape the initiative. But there was also um, the organisations that you can see on the, uh, across the banner, across the bottom there, and a team of people at the Secretariat who were primarily Luke Hoffman Institute staff. And a big shout out to Melanie Ryan, who was the sort of leader of the whole initiative, and John Hutton, who was the sort of person who kind of conceived of the idea in the first place. So I'm going to talk through uh, a little bit about the process, a little bit about where we landed and some of the sort of reflections that I have from um, what we learned through the journey. And I really look forward to some conversation with you all towards the end about, yeah, some of the questions that this raises that I think are interesting for, for this particular community of scholars to be thinking about. Um, but to start off with, I would like to um, start where we ended or part of where we ended, which was um, in the commentary that was published in Nature Sustainability um, and this kind of speculative imagining of different biodiversity futures. So the first story starts, basic needs. Enjoying coffee and locally sourced breakfast cooked in a communal kitchen, you watch the news streamed through a vidcast. Luckily, your rations arrived yesterday, so you have fresh coffee for the first time in weeks. After widespread popular revolts in 2021, equality and social welfare are now prioritised by national governments. Many countries turned inward, focusing on food production for their citizens. With less consumption, trade and travel carbon emissions flatlined. This morning's news is evidence that this is, may have been too little too late. Cyclones in the Philippines, catastrophic wildfires in California and water shortages across the Andes. You wonder what could have been possible if there was more money available for research and innovation. Not all nature is thriving, 
healthy mangroves protect urbanised coastal forests from rising sea levels, urban food forests are buzzing with visitors and nature friendly farming provides food for local markets. However, efforts to protect wildlife are fading as funding has dried up. Iconic species like orangutans and giant pandas are probably extinct, but basic needs are being met and society seems to be adjusting to life within its limits. Wildlife rules. You wake up and open a bag of lab engineered coffee and rip open a box of fortified breakfast cereal from climate controlled farms. The local desalination plant ensures a constant supply of food despite ongoing droughts in your region. At the annual Global Conservation Summit, a virtual reality tour brings you and your colleagues thousands of miles away to the Congolese rainforest. You see gorillas protected by digital fencing and military drones. The project exemplifies the extreme global conservation measure measures adopted in 2021 as the world struggled to limit the spread of zoonotic diseases. Though impressed, you wonder where the people live and how they make a living. As priorities shifted from climate action, emissions growth continued. This means that while militarised conservation protects species locally, climate sensitive species are now only found in climate controlled enclosures in zoos. The Arctic is ice free in the summer and the polar bears are gone. More people are employed protecting species than hunting and harvesting them for food and trade, but society as a whole is disconnected from nature. Climate first. You munch your breakfast of locally farmed oats and an apple from your rooftop garden. As you down your carbon neutral coffee, it's met with a shot of nostalgia for a good cup of Venezuelan beans. Your Unity BCI brain computer implant projects drone footage from the Radical Climate Action Alliance, deserts covered with solar farms, oceans with, and with wind farms, and farmed land is covered with biofuel crops. The Alliance successfully advocated for environmental and human rights treaties to be revoked in 2021 in favour of a climate first charter that prioritises storing carbon and generating clean energy. You feel a sense of pride at a nuclear reactor displaying your national flag and consider how corporations have benefited from green energy partnerships while inequality has risen. The clip closes with images of carbon capturing trees in the Amazon. You'd love to visit one day, but carbon sanctuaries are closed to visitors. Not even Indigenous peoples who sustain these landscapes for thousands of years can enjoy them. Widespread restrictions on travel have devastated local economies and with no ecotourism, funding for conservation is scarce. The Great Barrier Reef has recovered, but wind farms have decimated avian species and bats. Oh, there we go. Wrong way. Okay. So that's where we landed. Uh, and this is where we started. So this is a popular comic that I like to use in a lot of my presentations that sort of some, somewhat summarises the sort of state of play when we think about sort of the role of science in how we might conceptualise um, environmental change and our responses to it. There's been widespread assumptions that, that there's a number of different reasons why biodiversity is continuing to decline. And the intention of the Biodiversity Revisited initiative was really to consider what was really driving this. Is it failing institutions, the inability of science to mobilise change, complex systemic drivers that really don't get considered in local conservation work, a lack of compelling narratives, um, the colonial legacy of conservation, a fractured epi epistemic community, or an inability of biodiversity to connect with everybody's lived, with the daily and lived reality of many people around the world. Um, and one sort of problem frame which we really coalesced around as the project moved on but wasn't hugely present from the outset is the notion that conservation is blind to issues of justice, race and inequality. So the Biodiversity Revisited, the, the initial title for the project was called What's Wrong with Biodiversity? And part of that was really sort of a, a question to ask, is it, is it, what is, what is wrong with the notion of biodiversity, the concept, the science, the institutions that underpin efforts to conserve it, all at the same time while we see the continued decline of biodiversity around the world. So we started off with this proposition statement, which you know largely summarises the things that I have just outlined there. 
Um, and what we did with the proposition statement was we sent it to a number of different experts around the world, soliciting provocative commentaries, short essays that have been um, compiled in this collection called Seeds of Change. I think there's 32 essays in total, including eight essays from early career researchers. And we basically asked them to respond to this provocation, but from their very different disciplinary perspectives, backgrounds, experiences and expertise. And those all formed the inputs into a process um, that unfolded over two years and included over 300 people from around the world. Um, and I think in, in total, 46 nationalities. Um, but I'll, I'll speak to some of that in a bit. Anyway, so this figure is somewhat where we landed towards the end. I mean, there's a little bit of reconstructing history in the way that I'm telling this, this story here. Um, but this is, this is how we came to conceptualise what we were doing. So we were sort of drawing all of these diverse strands of thinking from across various social science disciplines, various aspects of conservation policy practice, conservation disciplines to sort of ask this question of what's wrong with biodiversity and why is it continuing to decline despite sort of a lot of effort in both research and policy and practice to try and halt its degradation. And the notion of biodiversity revisited was what we were sort of catalyzing a journey and an ongoing reflexive process that at the end of the sort of loops of these circles we would come to kind of a new set of ideas which is the research agenda that we generated um, that that come into the future once people have sort of done some thinking around the questions that were posed in that agenda that we would come back together again um, or us or some other iteration of um, kind of a collective of people. This sort of biodiversity revisited never really had a kind of um, we're gathering these people, we're going to implement this agenda. It was more a momentum around the movement to generate the agenda and, and hope that sort of it gets picked up by those who were part of the process of developing it um, and, and others that might be interested into the future. So the, the initiative was really guided from the beginning by a set of principles which we iteratively refined over the course of the project. So it was always intended to be pluralist, so welcoming a range of different perspectives. We, we acknowledged from the outset that consensus was not our objective. Um, the entire initiative was really around fun, um, founded on this notion of reflexivity, a sort of moment to pause and think about what has been done and to what effect and what can be done into the future. Um, and to ask those questions about what can, what has been done and whether it's worked or not, it required a degree of humility to kind of acknowledge that perhaps past efforts, while good intended, may have been misguided and needed to be kind of reconsidered. Uh, the process itself was, was hugely adaptive. I mean, from the very beginning all the way through to the end, I think, the steering committee and the secretariat really only had a sort of vision to maybe one or two steps down the path. So we continued to sort of adapt and mould to, to what was coming out of the dialogues and the discussions and, and opportunities as they came. Um, it was also attempted to be grounded in a notion of pragmatism. And I think that there was a lot of pragmatic decisions that were being made through the implementation of it and an aspiration that what we found would be pragmatic, what we came up with would be pragmatic. But I think that as we went along, we did sort of, um, we did experience some critiques around the degree to which it was a practical agenda versus a research agenda. And this is, you know, I think something that we can kind of contemplate later perhaps. Um, to what extent is good, reflexive, critical social science, pragmatic, does there need to, do these things need to be put in a, as a polarity or where you land on, on that? So I think that's sort of one of the interesting tensions that we experienced. There was a real attempt for the process to be as inclusive as possible. And I think in some respects we succeeded in this um, and I think in others perhaps we didn't. Um, but but there was a real desire from the beginning that this would reach out to sort of beyond the conservation mainstream and try to be as globally diverse as possible within the limits of the funding that we had available. Um, 
with sort of fairness and equity and justice, as I said before, kind of emerged through the process as critical issues for biodiversity to, to consider. Um, so, but that wasn't, I, I think it's fair to say, wasn't, wasn't front and centre at the very beginning. And there was this idea that we needed to be innovative and to be kind of through this process of recombination and renewal, bringing together what to those working within the field of political ecology may seem old hat, but for those of the participants who were from more of the biophysical sciences, new ideas and new ways of thinking and the notion that bringing these all of these different groups together instead of sort of the biodiversity community that tends to sit in different camps talking to themselves, the hope was that the innovation would be found in bringing them all together. Um, and a strong desire to be accountable to, to our funders and our constituents, which um, I think is an important thing to think about as we go forwards in terms of the idea that we might want to try and mobilise some action around this agenda. And I think it's probably fair to say that COVID has been part of um, making it a little bit difficult to maintain the momentum that we generated um, as we got there. So as I said previously, this was a two-year process that had um, that was kicked off with a steering committee uh, meeting in Zurich in early 2019. There were multiple kind of circles of 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 action and dialogue through the project and the steering committee was one of the key um, sites of this discussion. The steering committee was comprised of members of the partner organisations who received the grant in the first place. And then um, in September of 2019 in Vienna, we brought together, uh, there were 62 invited participants and I think probably about 15 to 20 people from the partner organisations um, in a two and a half day dialogue. Um, and as you can see there, there's sort of picture on the um, picture on the left hand side with the justice there, there. That was sort of the beginning of the very, very first activity of the meeting where we surfaced the elephants in the room, which was what what would we fail if we had not discussed these things? And there were so many elephants that were talking about justice. It just became really clear that that was a key thing on people's minds. Um, and then the tree on the right side, hand side is one of the last activities that we did, what we would take and what we would leave behind as a consequence of the um, of the activities. I've never been to a meeting like this before. I think it's probably fair to say that lots of people um, who participated would agree with this. It's the only professional uh, meeting that I've been in where there was a collective moment of grief um, where a number of people cried after a brave intervention by one of the early career scholars who was invited there to participate. Um, she would travelled to the meeting from India. It's the first time she'd been to an international meeting and she really shared a heartfelt um, expression of the challenges that she found herself kind of do personal dilemmas around should I get on an aeroplane to go to this meeting, to this amazing opportunity? What does it mean for me and the people who I work with at the grassroots to be doing this? Um, and I think it sort of sparked this sort of real sort of moment where I think a lot of people, a lot of the people in the room felt the sort of connection between the deeply personal and the political um, and and it was just it was just a really profoundly empowering moment for us to recognise that talking about grief while talking about hope and agency was really an important part of what it was that we were doing. And then finally, this is a picture from one of our last um, gatherings, which was a was held at the Rockefeller Centre in Bellagio, and this literally was. Um, two or three days before the Italian COVID outbreak hit the media. Hit the media. Um, and, you know, the last face-to-face -face international meeting that I've been to um, since then, and, you know, the world kind of turned upside down after that. And what's kind of interesting is that we were we were writing that commentary that I started with, that nar those narratives about what the future might look like and how 2020 might be this pivotal, 2021 might be this pivotal moment. All of that ideation was happening as the world was changing around us. So I won't spend too long on this one, but this is just a little bit more about sort of the different 
intellectual inputs into the process. So the, the seeds of change, the compilation of essays that we had, we ran an early career competition that had, oh, I'm forgetting now, I think over 150 uh, submissions from people around the world. We selected eight, um, uh, eight prize winners from that and they came to the um, initiative in Vienna and stayed through the journey. We had did a range of background literature reviews. We held some talks among from by experts within the steering committee. Um, we had a social, a very active social media campaign um, that was generated thanks to our excellent social media advisor Nikki Rust. And then we had a number of face to face and online dialogues where we sort of reflected on all of these inputs and and generated various different outputs from the project. So the research and action agenda, the nature commentary. We wrote a submission to the It Best Transformative Change Assessment that with the scoping workshop was sort of being kind of crafted as the process was unfolding. And there's also a special issue in environmental conservation. So this is just a little bit more from the um, where we landed, the 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 nature commentary sort of had these speculative worlds at the start of it, and then we kind of cons sort of considered things that we felt were really critical to think about biodiversity futures. So, sort of a real need to think about and build anticipate anticipatory leadership within the biodiversity community. I think conservation has a sort of history of being a little bit backwards looking from its sort of roots within a notion of saving places, species, landscapes in forms that they once were before um, before human development to sort of broadly characterise. And I think that there's a need to start to look forwards and accept that there's sort of shared responsibility for how we might come about mobilising to move towards that future. And, and, and I think particularly as is quite apparent within those worlds that we crafted, there are some real trade-offs that 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 the biodiversity community generally doesn't like to confront and discuss. Um, but, you know, this real need that we're going to have to act without certainty that's kind of quite apparent across a number of different sort of environmental domains. Um, but but that, that was a real key driver in thinking about kind of moving from these speculative worlds, okay, well, how do we actually move into um, a new phase for the biodiversity community? Um, so then the, the research agenda, which was generated by a subset of the participants who came to the Vienna meeting, so people volunteered to be part of the co-development of the research agenda. I think there was 25 people that participated closely in that process. The objective of the agenda was, as you can see there, to contribute to sustaining diverse and just futures for life on Earth. It has four different chapters, which you can see on the slides there. Um, and I, I mean, I won't go into much detail on the individual chapters. It's all in the agenda, which was published in Conservation Biology. But there's also a longer version of the agenda that has sort of more about the kind of background thinking around biodiversity revisited and why we kind of mobilise the initiative and also more detail in each of the chapters than just the sort of couple of paragraphs that end up in the Conservation Biology um, manuscript. So some reflections on the process. I was amazed at the appetite for change. I mean, when I first sent out the provocations to people to invite their contributions, um, I was expecting, you know, non-responses or no thanks, I don't have time for this, and had an overwhelming response from people saying, thank you so much, this is really needed, we really need this moment of critical reflection and I think a real kind of welcoming from people who were perhaps outside of the biodiversity mainstream to see these kind of mainstream organisations like WWF kind of inviting critical thinking about the problem of biodiversity. And so that kind of continued throughout. I was just I was always astounded at the degree to which people wanted to come on the journey and stay with us, despite the fact that it was, you know, a relatively um, open-ended and challenging process. 
Uh, there was real value in empowering early and mid-career professionals. So it's sort of, there was a strong desire from the steering committee and from the secretariat that was kind of mobilised um, and, and was never really part of the original pitch in the grant, but became a big part of what we were trying to do was to sort of make space for different voices and to empower um a new generation, you know, I think there's there's a lot of reflection in for a lot of reflection and feedback that we received from participants that that was one of the most valuable parts of it. There was an energy and enthusiasm that I think um, was really only generated by that kind of focus on empowering those voices. Um, as I said previously, it was a really adaptive and open process, and I think that that was fantastic because it enabled us to go places that we never imagined were possible at the outset. But I think that there was definitely people who really struggled with that. There was a lot of, well, what are we doing here? What's this agenda? Who's going to implement it? Who's it for? What's it trying to do? What do you mean a research agenda? Is research really what's needed to help biodiversity? Like there was just, I think people, and, and it, the process kind of self-selected and filtered. There was definitely people who came to the Vienna meeting and hated it and just couldn't handle the ambiguity and the kind of emergent process. And I think that in on reflection, we could have done a better job of sort of signposting. I think people kept looking to the secretariat to set the course and tell people what to do and the secretariat was very we really wanted people to co-create where we were going we didn't want to say that and we could have been a bit better at explaining you know we're providing the platform you you know design the play um we just we i think we struggled with that a little bit um, there was a real focus on on trying to bring in as diverse a voices as possible and to sort of reach beyond the conservation mainstream. Um, but I think that 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 had had you know huge value in bringing different groups of people together, but it also had challenges in that there was a lot of reinventing of wheels that have had you know huge amounts of deep thinking within any of the different kind of intellectual or practical communities um and so you'd sort of have these conversations with people where there was sort of this bright shiny new amazing way of thinking about something for one group that other people in the room were sort of saying yeah yeah, yeah we thought about that 10 years ago like we know the answer so there was sort of I think sometimes a little bit of rub there um, that that meant that perhaps we didn't, you know, given that given the scope of what we were trying to do, two years really isn't very long, even though it felt like a long time at the time. Um, you know, there's some there's some kind of shared language and shared understanding that enables you to dig deeper that we didn't perhaps get because it was so diverse. Um, there's just the ongoing structural bias within global conservation, which is reflected in the organisations that received the grant, in the steering committee that sort of steered the whole project from the outset. I mean, it was all northern conservation organisations and no matter how hard we tried and no matter how much we wanted to, we still were really unable to break out of that to, to the full extent. I think it was more diverse than... Um, the initiative ended up being much more diverse than the where we started from, um, but but all of the meetings were held in northern um, northern countries, um, and while there was a global somewhat global representation in it, it still had a sort of North America, uh, European, and Australian dominance in it, um, largely because of the group of people who were leading it. Um, and yeah, as I said before, I think there was real value in in sort of grappling with these tensions between hope and grief and agency and something that's really, really was quite profound for me and I think others that this is the space we need to operate in and there needs to be, I think I came to learn through it that there needs to be more of a professional conversation around loss and what loss means and how we kind of um you know Donna Haraway 
kind of grapple with this challenge of staying with the trouble of living in a sort of somewhat suboptimal space how do we still maintain hope and a sense of agency while we're confronted with so many challenges um, some reflections on our attempt at pluralism. I mean, I think this is kind of interesting. What does pluralism really look like and mean in practice? How do we interpret it and what are the implications? I think um, there was a real drive to, to, to make this a plural agenda, but I think that there's there was definitely critiques that it was too critical social science and it alienated kind of mainstream conservation people or that it didn't even invite mainstream conservation people. So that left us open to critique. Um, and I think sort of questions that were raised around, well, you know, there's some pretty fundamental trade-offs here. What does pluralism look like in the context of these ongoing conflicts? that have sort of been part of conservation's history and will be part of its future. And I think there was definitely an epistemic politics going on around this question of who gets to define a biodiversity agenda and what it should look like. I mean, I think we had, there was some pretty interesting conversations um, that played out between different people at different moments over the course of it around like, well, biodiversity is a scientific term and revisiting biodiversity is the domain of the biodiversity scientists and the social scientists' role in the room. Social scientists study conservation because conservation is a practice and biodiversity is a science. And sort of, I think, um, despite the fact that participants at the event in Vienna were roughly split, sort of one third social science, one third biophysical science, one third interdisciplinary, there was this sense that bio biophysical scientists weren't in the room, that they were missing from the discussion. There wasn't enough space given for the kind of biodiversity science, um, which I found really interesting because they were there. I like I know because I had the spreadsheet with everyone's disciplinary backgrounds. I know the breakdown of it. And I think it was sort of people are really used to conservation conversations being dominated by biophysical science questions and biophysical scientists. And so when the whole platform was being around questions of justice and equity and pluralism, the the kind of that conversation had a different stage. So anyway, I think that that was kind of quite interesting and, um, you know, something to reflect on with this group, I guess. So I think we landed on this notion that how we design diverse and just futures on for life on earth will necessarily take many forms. I think that's something that, that the participants of the initiative really hold true. We saw this as a starting point to kind of revisit how we conceptualise biodiversity and how we act in response to its decline. Um, and there's lots of great ideas and outputs that are out there. But yeah, as I said before, I think the kind of COVID universe has moved things along a bit. Um, justice can no longer be separate from efforts to address biodiversity, climate and sustainability. I mean, I think this is probably nothing new to this community, but I think to see that kind of front and centre in a biodiversity agenda coming out of a, some pretty mainstream conservation organisations was a was a big win for for kind of an ongoing kind of agenda of the sort of more socially oriented biodiversity community for quite a long time, um, and we really would sort of um, encourage people to consider where we might go with where we landed with the Biodiversity Revisited initiative and, and how to think about kind of engaging with this diversity of visions and, and knowledges and what that might mean for the future of biodiversity research and, and, and action. Um, so thanks very much. This is just the references for the um, primary outputs from, from the initiative and, yeah, questions. Thanks. Thank you Thank so you much, Katrina, for that really interesting uh, presentation.